Elizabeth Johnson is a member of the Sisters of St. Joseph and the Distinguished Professor of Theology at Fordham University's Bronx campus in New York City, the site of my interview with her. Well, first, would you please tell me about the, the time and the place that you were born into? Well, I was born in Brooklyn, a borough of New York City, in, um, during the Second World War. And what role did religion play when you were young? It was just there. It was an integral part of life. You know, I went to a Catholic grammar school, was part of parish life. Uh, we had neighbors of various religions, but um, pretty much everybody was religious in some way at that point in our neighborhood. And you went into a religious order fairly young. I did. What, what, what led to that? Well, I was very attracted to religion. To uh, I'll tell you what attracted me was the beauty of uh, liturgical processions and high Catholic liturgies with incense and candles. I loved all that as a child. But there was something in the uh, notion of God and of giving your life to God that attracted me very greatly. And so when I graduated from high school, in those days it was not unusual to join a religious order at that point. Today we're in a, a very different culture. Um, so the year that I joined my religious order, there were 76 of us in postulancy the first year. So it, it was, in a sense, culturally acceptable, but it was also what I wanted to do. What drew you to the formal study of theology? Well, I think I, I would have to say it would just be my questions. I remember at my uh, receiving my first Holy Communion, I asked the question, why are we receiving this Jesus in the host if Jesus is in our hearts all the time anyway? And that was like seven years old. So like, I always had these questions. So theology was where you could sort of pursue your questions. Well, what does it mean to you to be a Catholic theologian? Well, as I have discovered, it's, it's a vocation within the vocation of being a Christian. It's a specific call to do the thinking uh, about what faith means in the light of new questions that come up. You had to sit for a very long time in front of books or screens these days and think and write and read and research and, and actually love it because if you didn't love it, you wouldn't have the energy to go on with it. So it's a way of living out the Christian vocation that's of service to the wider church. Could you talk about how you came to write She Who Is? It started with a, a controversy in the liturgy when uh, the priest presider uh, prayed to God our mother. And then people were using um, God the creator, redeemer, and sanctifier instead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And some people in the congregation were like, this is wonderful, and others were, this is heretical. And I thought, I don't know what it is, but I have to investigate this. I'm curious myself, is this valid? Is this a, a right way of speaking about God? And of course, researching uh, for She Who Is, the more I got into those subjects, the more I realized, not only is it right, it's wonderful, and we should all be doing it because it brings in the, more of a fullness of the scripture. It opens up more of the mystery of who God is. Um, it, 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 how should I say, it inspires prayer in a whole different way. In your most recent book before the one that's about to come out, Quest for the Living God, you, you seek to expand on what you call Western society's characteristically trivial image of God. How, how would you describe that image and how, would, how do you respond to that? The, the stereotype of God or the caricature that I'm talking about there is that God is an individual male authority figure in the sky who requires our obedience. And that is just not who God is. It's not only in our culture, it's obviously also the way God gets preached a great deal in the church. First of all, God is Trinitarian uh, in the Christian framework. So you're not talking about an individual person. Second of all, God is not male, literally. Uh, so there's a gender question that goes on. What's the impact of these inadequate images of God? Well, it leads to a very cramped relationship with God, a very cramped spirituality. It leads to people either being afraid or, as we see today in droves, walking away from the church. Um, it, it, it's interesting to me, this emphasis on obedience that we have vis-a-vis -vis God. Um, if you look at the teaching of Jesus, he uses the word obey once 
as I understand it, in the Gospels, and that's in one of the resurrection appearances, but never in his own life of preaching. He's always calling us to love and to forgive and to do unto others and to give the cup of cold water. And so and that's true religion. I would say Jesus' own life is not a good example of obedience. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been killed, <laughs> um, except he was being obedient to the call of the Spirit, and that's different. Would you describe what you're doing in your book that's about to come out? Uh, Ask the Beasts, Darwin and the Love of God, and the God of Love. God of Love, right. Ask the Beast is a line you may well know from the book of Job, not a well-known line, and it says, Ask the Beast and they will teach you. Speak to the birds of the air and they will instruct you. And it's ask the fish of the sea and the plants and so on. Has not the hand of the Lord done this? In his hand is the breath of every living creature and the life of human beings themselves. It's a beautiful, uh, instructing us to turn to our fellow creatures on this earth and ask them what they can teach us about God. And my initial instinct going into this book is we haven't done that. When is the last time the church has asked the animals anything? You know, uh, we've ignored them. And our theology has been very focused on the human dilemma, our sinfulness, our need for redemption, our moral uh, demands, and so on. And we have become so focused that way that we have lost, really, the doctrine of creation and the whole reality of the life of animals and plants that inhabit this earth with us and form with us one community of creation. Well, the animals and the plant have a story. And my uh, idea going in is that Darwin tells that story better than anyone, the story of evolution. So as the beasts, they will tell you how they came to be and how the creative love of God brought them into being and put them with us as a community of creation on this earth. And my thought is by changing the uh, paradigm, really, the structure in which we think theology so that it includes all of life, not just our own life, human life, um, we'll have a different basis on which to act ethically in terms of ecological disaster today. I'd like to talk a little bit about the themes of the conference uh, that we'll be talking about. Um, The first day we're talking about the cross. What's the role of the cross for you? I have become very wary of that kind of question, with apologies, <laughs> because it's reflective of the Western tradition that, at least in the last thousand years, latched onto the cross to the exclusion of the life of the historical Jesus and to the exclusion of the resurrection. It's often talked about in terms of <clears throat> atonement. How do you speak about, what is that term, how do you use that term? Put it in there as one of the metaphors that that can be used. If I could just say one thing, though, everyone has to keep in mind going into this conversation on the cross. The cross did not change God's mind. The cross did not make God look kindly upon us when God was angry at us before. So is there good news in the cross? If you put it together with the life and preaching of Jesus of the Gospels and the resurrection, all together as, as the story of Jesus, it's part of what the good news of Jesus is. But if you ask the question just the way you did in itself, the cross by itself, no, it's a disaster. So in context of Jesus' life and resurrection, is the cross good news? In that context, it is, uh, because we are taking Jesus as the Gospels present him uh, as the incarnate word of God, the word made flesh, God with us, Emmanuel, who has joined our life and been willing to taste the dregs of suffering all the way to death and the grave in solidarity with all of us that go that path. And in that sense, be with us in that suffering and then with the resurrection, bring us through it to new life. So in that context, it's it's the best kind of news you could have. So what does it mean to be saved? Well, it means... First of all, to have God with you in the struggles of life. What does it mean to be saved? I'm so struck by Jürgen Moltmann's line, piece of bread on the plate in front of a starving person is salvation. Um, In in other words, (laughs) to quote another theologian, 
Jan Sobrino from El Salvador. He said, if the world has been redeemed by Christ, then it should look a little more like it. In, in John, Jesus says, I, I came, they may have life and have it abundantly. Uh, how do you see abundance? It means goodness and wholesomeness and um, happy goodness at every level. So the physical and the psychological, the relational, the interrelational, the structural in terms of justice, the spiritual, the hope. To me, it might be a metaphor for the, for the reign of God that Jesus preached about, life in abundance. It, in our most recent Trinity Institute conference, Joan Chittister uh, said that in a world that's shaped by evolution, then we're called to be co-creators with God. And particularly thinking about the the, the faith itself, I mean, do, does, do, you, do you see that as an evolving thing? Oh, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, the history of, if you just want to take Christianity, but any religion shows how the faith develops as, as culture changes, as history goes on, as people um, come up with new abilities and new challenges and new questions, yes. That it's not that it changes in the sense that it's no longer recognizably the faith, but, but it develops, it grows. Now, I'm not saying everything is change. That's not true, okay, because we have this fundamental gospel that, that adheres. But it's always a question of how does that gospel get heard by people in a new era? An awful lot of people are walking away thinking it's outmoded. It's not. It's, it's, it's a source of enormous life. But, but that, therefore, has to change. We have to say the same thing in different words. We have to bring it forward so that the, the new life of baptized people today fertilizes this and really brings out new riches. There's more in the Christian tradition than we have dreamed of, and there's more still ahead than we have dreamed of.